Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Ooh, what an excitingly challenging week it has been, huh? Um, I know there's a lot of things on our minds and our hearts. Um, I just wanted to uh, remind you um, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verses 6, this is our call to worship. Um, it lets you guys get there. I always remember this um, through uh, one of the worship songs that we... Uh, one of my favorites, it says, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I know I, I definitely um, drew uh, near to this verse. It, it spoke to me this week um, uh, in, in a couple different ways that God is creator, um, not just of this world, but he's creator of, of myself, um, my family, and my life. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to remind you guys, encourage you guys that uh, God is near um, in spite of uh, what the world may say. Uh, he, is, he is near, and um, I encourage you guys to draw near to him. Father God, we want to thank you this morning for the blessing of being here in your house. Father, we come with anxieties and burdens and struggles. But Father, we also come with joys in the ways that you've blessed us and reached out to us. And so, Father, today we just want to come and say that we lay those things at your feet. Father, we lay our burdens and our anxieties down knowing that they have a better place in your hands than in our hearts. So, Father, now that we are in your house, Lord, we don't presume to ask that you meet us here because you've already been here. We do ask that your Holy Spirit would come into our hearts and teach us this morning and give us words of life and truth. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. For we've prayed it in the wonderful and beautiful name of Jesus and for his sake. And everyone said, Amen. Please stand for our opening hymn.
Amen. Praise Him. Now it's time for our Kiki story, and that's going to be given by our very own Pastor Jaime. Okay, Kiki. So unfortunately, you cannot um, come to me, but I'll just stand here. So how many of you, Kiki, raise your hand loud and proud so everyone can see? How many of you were at Bikeathon yesterday? Raise your hand. Oh, sorry, your hands. Zach, JC, where's Sky? Sky, is, where's Sky somewhere here? Uh, Kim is over there and Dom. I'm looking for Sky. Where's Sky? I don't see her. That's okay. So, bike a Now, of those guys that raised your hand, how many of you are still sore today? Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, I was at bike a too, and man, I'm impressed with you guys. I'd like to say that I rode my bike really far, but I think you guys all beat me. Why did I not ride far yesterday? Some of you know. What happened to my bike? You had what? Flat tire. How many flat tires? Two. two flat tires. Not just one, but two. I think that's pretty impressive, you know? You have to try to be that bad. Um, so I had a flat tire, but so I wasn't that sore. I'm not that sore today, but you guys, man, you guys are really sore today. And you know what? Let me ask you this. Did you guys stretch after you were done with your bike a no, JC's saying no. Well, guess what we're going to do today? We're going to stretch. And not just you guys, but whoever wants to dress. So, all right, guys. Can you stand up? You guys stand up. And everyone else who's willing to dress, I want you guys to stand, stand up now. You guys are like, we're not going to stand up. If you're willing to join us in this exercise, let's all stand up and we're going to do some stretch. So, my favorite stretch, and I'm partially doing this to prepare you for the sermon. No, I'm not. That's a joke. So, my favorite stretch, I like to try and touch my toes. So I want to see you guys try and touch your toes. So here we go. Ready? One, two, three. So you lean down so you guys can touch your toes. Oh, Zach and JC got it. I see it. I heard some bones pop, popping. Those may have been mine. All right, come back up slowly. Excellent. Okay. Now, when you ride your, your bike, one of the muscles that hurt a lot is what? Your, your thighs, your quads, right? So we're going to do one of my favorite stretches, too. You're gonna, it's also a balancing stretch. So you're going to grab one of your legs. You're going to hold it up like that. And you're going to see if you can hold your balance. Oh, JC already lost hers. Okay, good, good. You've got to feel the stretch in your thigh. You want to pull it back. You can feel it. You've got to hold it just like that. I don't even know if I'm doing it right. Brandon probably knows if I'm failing or not. He's doing it. Awesome. Now you've got to go with your other leg too. So put that leg down. Bring the other one up. Yeah, do that stretch. There you go. Cakey, awesome. Thank you, guys. And we're joined, we're joined by some adults. That's so awesome. Okay. Now, another one that I have not mastered yet. You have to put your arms behind your back and see if you can touch it. Who can do it? Oh, I can barely touch one. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Are you, who's touching both hands? Some people are, oh, JC, okay, Zach is, okay. Some people are, okay. Now, try with, with, with your other hand if you can. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Those of you that connected your hands, can you do it? Yeah. Some of you are like, no, 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 I can't. One of my arms is sitting there. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, all right, you guys can sit down. You guys can sit down. Thank you so much. So stretching is good to do not just after you exercise, but when as well. Before. So I was going to tell you guys why that's true, but I don't want to make a fool of myself because there's someone in this room who knows better. Than I do. So, Brandon, can you tell us real quick why stretching is important before and after exercise? Thanks, Pastor. Uh, he didn't put me on the spot. He told me beforehand. So, I had some time to think about it and to, uh, you know, I guess explain it in, in layman's terms. Uh, basically, stretching before, I'm glad you brought up that point because we don't do that, but it's so important. And the reason it's important is because it prepares our bodies, and not just our bodies, but our minds as well, uh, to perform uh, an activity. And uh, why that's important is uh, it reduces or decreases our chances of getting injured. And so you guys want to st stay injury-free, right, when we're playing so you can keep on going. So that's one of the biggest reasons why, and it's like one of the things we just forget, um, but it's so important. I'm guilty of it myself, um, even though I talk about it all the time, so it's just one of the things we're resistant to, resistant to, so. So we stretch because it prepares our what? It prepares our bodies to do what? To be, to be ready, to get active, right? So let me tell you this, if you take care of your body by stretching, your body will take care of you. That's right, it's like your body will take care of you, and not just prevent you from getting injuries, but I want to say this. 
you want to ride further and ride longer at Bikeathon next year, get some more miles, which means more money, next time just stretch a little bit more. Because stretching doesn't just take care of you, it actually makes you better at what you're doing. And so, cake, the story today is if you forgot to stretch, that's okay. Randon does it too, and I do it as well. But whenever we're exercising or playing or having fun, let's just remember to stretch, not just our bodies, but sometimes we need to stretch our faith in God too. Because the more we stretch that, the more we're going to grow and get stronger in our faith. So thank you guys for stretching with me this morning. I hope uh, this can become a good habit in all of our lives throughout uh, our days. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. We've got to stretch our, our faith. Amazing. Um, now it's time for our tithes and offerings. Will the deacons please join me up front, and we will say a short prayer. Uh, this, week, this week's appeal is for local church budget, and our loose offerings are used for our local church budget. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we just thank you again for the uh, ability to come here today, this morning, to worship you. Uh, to praise you and to give you honor and glory. Lord, I just pray now that um, you help us um, exercise our faith muscle um, in um, giving back a small portion of what you've given us. Um, give us great faith, especially in these times that we live in now, Lord, so that this tithe may be used uh, to um, hasten that day of your second, your soon second day uh, coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading will be found in Acts 1, verse 8. And it reads, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to all the end of the earth.
Let the Spirit of God be the one guiding you. And all the glory be to the Lord. Let the Spirit of God be the one Yes, all the glory, may all the glory be to the Well, let's do this. We're going to use a mic, um, and if cannot use this today, then hey, that's totally okay too. So thank you for that short intermission, technical difficulties. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It is good to be here with you all, and um, I do want to thank uh, Keeves and Uncle Lucky for all the work they do back there. It's like a, I mention this all the time, but it's a spaceship back there. Like you go in, there's like a, there's, there's like a monitor there, there's switches and levers and buttons, and you can tell that I have no clue what's going on, but they, they do. So thank you guys so much for that. Um, so priorities, 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 priorities. About two weeks ago, I had a worship at uh, the Adventist school here, and I had a lot of fun. So what I had the kids do, I brought a little bag of tools. They're not my bag of tools. They actually belong to Kaylin. Um, when we got married, she was the one that had all the tools, not me. So, but... I now have more tools than she does, so it's all good in the hood. Um, but anyway, so I brought a little bag of tools to school, and what I had um, the kids do, I had a, uh, Keith brought a big piece of wood, and I said, you know, guys, um, there's a phrase that my father-in-law taught me. There's the right tool for the right job, right? You need the right tool for the right job. And so I said, look, but sometimes you don't have the right tool, but you still got to get the job done. And so I said, here's a piece of wood. Here's a nail. You know, you're trying to hammer this nail in. Oh, thank you, Renan, so much. So what's the phrase? Right tool for the right job. Okay, awesome. So I, I give the kids a nail and a piece of wood, and I say, you know, you need to hammer th th this nail. But I'm going to trip over myself. Very good. Okay, I'm good. I can stretch, right? That's it. So I tell them hammer this nail into the wood, but you don't have a hammer. I said, what if the only tool you had was, and I pull out this wrench. I said, here's a wrench. And I had the kids like, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it. And so I, I called one kid up and I said, here you go. Here's the, the, the wrench. And so I, they were looking at it for a moment, looking at the nail, and then they figured out, I can just use the flat side. And so they just start hammering the nail. And it actually worked surprisingly well. I was hoping they'd struggle a little bit more, but it, it did work. But it still wasn't as good as if you had a hammer. Right? And so they were able to, you know, sort of awkward, kind of this awkward side, side swipe. They were hammering the nail and it got in there. And I said, okay, great. But sometimes you need to pull a nail out. And again, it just so happens you don't have a hammer. Oh, but I said, what if you had a wire cutter? And so I, I, I'm like, who wants to come? And so all the kids were like, oh, I'll do this. So I give these kids a wire cutter and they're trying to figure out how do I get this to happen? So they... They look at the nail and they look at the wire cutter and say, well, I can clamp it and I can... So one kid was try, trying to grab it with the wire cutter and they're trying to pull it out. And at first it doesn't work. And finally they succeed in pulling this nail out with these wire cutters. And I said, okay, great. You figured it out. I said, but what if you need to cut something, right? So I pull out a piece of paper. You need to cut something, but you don't have... What do you use to cut stuff? Scissors. Skizzers, as some people say. You don't have scissors. Oh, but you do have now making it really hard. You have a flathead screwdriver. And the kids are like, I'll do it. And so I give them the flathead screwdriver. And this, this was my favorite part. I go and I see what the students are trying to do. They are stabbing the piece of paper with the flathead screwdriver, trying to get a clean cut. Because I said, you have to give me the cleanest cut you can. And so finally, they finish and they hand me the piece of paper. It looks like someone took a bite out of it. Just this jagged piece of paper. 
They got it cut, but let me tell you, it wasn't easy. And so when you don't have the right tool for the right job, you might be able to get, get the job done, but it's going to be harder. It's going to be slower. And the end result is probably going to be mediocre at best. And so here's what happens as Christians, I, I think. Probably most, it's probably safe to say that most people in this room probably have to some degree memorize what our job as Christians is, right? You know, when Jesus left and he ascended that last time with his disciples, he gave them the great one. Commission, right? And you could probably tell this to me by heart. Go, what? Therefore make, what is it? Make disciples of coalition, number one, and then what? And then baptizing them in the name of the Son, Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to, to observe all the things that I have taught you, right? And is there anything more to it? I'm with you always, right? Okay, so if you had to sum it up, our job as Christians, if you wanted to say it that way, the right job is to go, make disciples, baptize, teach, right? So we got that figured out. We, we, for the most part, know that we're not just meeting here to hang out. Well, at least I hope we know that. But if you were to put all of us in a room and said, here's the right job, go, make disciples, baptize, teach, and then you asked us, how do you do it? you're probably going to get as many responses as there are people in that room. We should do small groups. No, 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 no. We need to go do a survey in the community. How about we just offer glow tracks to everyone? No, no, no. We need to put on evangelistic meetings and invite people. No, no, no. The, the meetings are too up, uh, up front. Let's draw them in with the cooking school. And so on and so right. And so you have all these ideas, all these different ways of getting the right job done. But what ends up happening is this. Each of those things is good. Passing out glow tracks, evangelistic meetings, small groups, meeting felt needs, surveys, and so on and so forth. They're each good, and each of those things is appropriate and effective in a certain place at a certain time, and depending on who you are, who your audience is, when you're doing it. But what ends up happening, I think, sometimes is we as a church have the, the right job, and we try and tackle the right job of fulfilling this great commission, and more often than not, we pick these strategies and these tools and we feel, it ends up feeling like a kid hammering a nail with a wrench or cutting a piece of paper with flathead screwdrivers. It just feels awkward. We're not really getting much progress and the progress we do, do have is kind of mediocre at best. And here's what I want to suggest to you today, church family. I want to suggest to you that it's not that we're using the wrong tools. It's that we're not prioritizing the most important tool. Because we got the right job, but we're going at it with, without the most important tool. And so this morning, we want to talk about what is our priority as Christians for witnessing and beyond. What is our priority? So with that in mind, please bow your heads and please pray for me and with me as we dig into God's Word this morning. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to spend time with my family, my church friends, and Lord, and with your Word and with you. Father, today as we talk about priorities and what your priority for us is, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be the one in this room opening up our hearts, drawing away all distractions, all anxieties, and Father, open our hearts to receive words of truth and words of life from you this morning. That we would leave this place with our priorities that much more aligned with yours. We ask this in the name of your Son. And everyone said, Amen. So, go with me real quick to the book of Luke chapter 24. This is towards the end of Luke. So you have in the Gospels, the New Testament starts with Matthew, Mark, Luke. Go to the book of Luke, chapter 24. Luke 24, starting at verse 45. Okay, so just a, a, a bit of context. Jesus is here walking with two, with two of his disciples on the road to where? Does anyone know? Emmaus, right? So this is after Jesus dies, and sometime after he resurrects, and his disciples, at least these two, they've heard rumors that he might have resurrected, but they're not really sure what to do with that. But more importantly, they just saw their Lord and Savior of three and a half years die. And so they're not, they're trying to make sense of, well, what happens next? What now? Right? Like our, all our hopes and dreams are dashed. And so Jesus finds them, but they don't know it's Jesus. 
And so Jesus is talking to them, and he confronts them, right? He talks to them about their misunderstanding of what the Messiah was supposed to do as opposed to what they thought he should have done. And so in verse 45, he begins to tell them, not just of what the Messiah was supposed to do, but of what's going to happen next. So pay careful attention here. Verse, 20, verse 45 of chapter 24 in Luke, it says, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer in the third day, rise from the dead, and that, what's the word there? The next word. Repentance for the what? For the forgiveness of sin should be, what's the word there? Preached, proclaimed in his name to how many nations? All nations. But starting where? Jerusalem. Now verse 48, you are what? You are witnesses of these things. But look at what it says in verse 49. So he says, look, Jesus died, he resurrected, and now what happens next is forgiveness of sins, repentance, and salvation is to be preached everywhere, starting in Jerusalem. And by the way, you're the witnesses. But look at what he says, verse 49. And behold, I am sending the, what's the word there? Promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with what? Power. Okay. So he tells them, your job is to be witnesses of things. What things? Not just of anything. Of the resurrection, of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and of the fact that human beings can receive forgiveness and salvation from their sins. But he says, but you have to do one thing first. You have to prioritize this. Before you go out, you have to go and wait for, he calls it the, the what of the Father, the promise of the Father and the blank from, from on high. What is it? Power, right? So the pro, there's a promise and there's a power that you got to wait for. The promise and the power is the priority. The promise and the power is the priority you have to wait for before you go and witness. But he doesn't really say much else. He just says, there's a promise, there's this power, but he doesn't reveal it all. But if we go to the book of Acts, so go with me to the book of Acts chapter 1. Jesus begins to unpack this. What is this promise of the, the Father and what is the power from on high? Acts chapter 1. So again, this promise and this power has to come. They have to receive this before they go out and do what? Before they go out and witness, right? And just a side note on witnessing, by the way. Being a witness in the Christian sense is not merely, listen carefully to this, is not merely communicating information that I know is true, that you don't know, so that you can know what's true, so that you can be set straight. Witnessing is not that merely. Witnessing is not me coming up here and telling information so that you can now know, oh, I was wrong and in the darkness and now I know what the truth is. Witnessing biblically is actually a, a broader spectrum of activities, which includes not just verbal communication, but also disinterested, genuine, selfless, other-centered love for the sake of the other person. Because, as we know, actions speak what? Louder than words. And oftentimes... It's our actions that witness to other people about God better than our words. Because in our loving people, what are we doing? We're actually revealing who God is, witnessing to who God is. So just so you know, when, I ref when we talk about witnessing in the Bible, since it's not just merely, here's some information. Let me tell you something that you don't know so that you can believe it, so that you can know what's right. Witnessing includes and actually is, I think, most effective when you live a life of love. It's the life lived out not just information spoken. Witnessing is life lived out. So, Acts chapter 1. Right? So, go with me to verse 4. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. It says there, While staying with them, he ordered them, there is again, not to depart from where? Jerusalem, but to wait for the, what is it? There it is, right? So he mentions it in Luke. Now he brings it again. Which, by the way, if you don't know this, Acts and Luke are in by the same person. They're like two, volume one and volume two of the same story. It's the story of Jesus and then the story of Jesus's followers. So he mentions, okay, wait in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father comes, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the what? The Holy Spirit. Oh, okay, so Jesus, the promise of the Father is what? The Holy Spirit. 
It's right there. It says, you were baptized with water, but there's another baptism. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Reading on. So when they had come together, this is verse 6. When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, look at this question. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What do they actually mean there? Will you what? What are they hinting at? What do they want Jews to actually do? Restore, what does it mean to restore the kingdom to Israel? To not be under what? Not be under Rome. Three and a half years after the disciples are with Jesus, their priorities are still set on this earthly success. Jesus, our nation is captured by the Roman nation. Are you finally now going to go and beat them to a pulp and give us our nation back? And so you think about it, like, have grace for yourself if you don't understand things because the disciples have been spend time with Jesus and they still don't get it, right? So, and Jesus so graciously deflects their, their question. Look at this, verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Now he brings them back, right? He circles back, verse 8. But you will receive, what's the word there? Power. Ah, he talks about the promise of the Father. Now he talks about the power. You receive power when the what? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be, what's the word there? Witnesses. You see how he's connecting all these ideas? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem first and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of what? The earth. To the end of the earth. So again, Jesus is making this very clear. Your job is to be my witness. Again, not just speaking information, but living out in your character, in your being, in your actions, living out who God is. Be my witness. But first, you need the promise and the power, which is the what? The Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. That's the priority. You need the Holy Spirit. So the question is this, why? You know, we oftentimes read the Bible and we see them, okay, yeah, okay, fine, good. We need the Holy Spirit. Ask why. Allow yourself to ask why. You ever have your kids say, Mom, why is the sky blue? Well, because blah, blah, blah. Well, why? And they just keep going on. God, I think, would have us do that a little bit more. Well, why do I need the Holy Spirit, God? Why is the Holy Spirit so important? Is it just because you say so? Well, yes and no. God says so, but there's a reason for it. So let's take some time to figure out why is the Holy Spirit so essential to our witnessing? Go with me to the book of John, one book before. So just go not too far away. John chapter 14. Why, why do we need the Holy Spirit? Why is Jesus prioritizing the Holy Spirit so much? So John chapter 14, starting at verse 15. In these next chapters, Jesus talks about a number of things, but he talks about the Holy Spirit. And by the way, this is t- taking place right before he's about to go into the garden of Gethsemane, go into his suffering and die on the cross. So just to place this in hi- history. John 14, chapter 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another what? Another helper. Another helper to be with you, how long? Forever. Even the spirit of, what does he call it? The spirit of? Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells what? With you and will be where? In you. So, okay, this is really cool. He doesn't say it explicitly, but he's referring to the Holy Spirit. But what I love is that he uses this word called helper. The actual, the, the actual word for helper in the original language has this connotation of the one who comes by you and cries out for you. The one who comes by you and the one who cries out for you. It's actually called uh, um, paracletos, para. It's by your side, kletos, to cry out, klyo, to cry out. That's a little bit of language. But the one who comes by you and cries out on behalf of you, what does that sound like? An advocate, right? Someone that works on your behalf. So why is the Holy Spirit so essential to witnessing? The most, I think one of the most obvious reasons is because the Holy Spirit is accessible. What do I mean by that? When you have a flat tire, you're in the middle of nowhere, you can have all the tools you have in the world at home. Those don't help you because they're not with you. The tools that help you when you're in a moment of Christ are the tools that are what? That are, that are with you. The tools you have there, that's what counts. So the reason why Jesus says you need the Holy Spirit first is because the Holy Spirit is accessible. The Holy Spirit's, where does he live? He lives in you. 
There's no place you can go that the Holy Spirit isn't there. This is what the, uh, the prophet, the king and prophet, David says in Psalm 139, where can I flee from your what? From your presence. Where can I go from your spirit, he says. Your presence and your spirit. He's like, I can't go anywhere, but your spirit's there with me. How much more when Jesus sends us out to take with us the one that's always there? We may forget our Bibles. We may forget our, our Bible studies. We may forget our PowerPoints. And, but we have the most important thing, Holy Spirit. He's by our side. He's crying out for us. He's advocating for us. So the Holy Spirit is essential because the Holy Spirit is what? Accessible. Accessible. He's always there, available for us. But not just that. You'll, you'll notice that he calls the, the Spirit the Holy Spirit of truth. Why does he do that? Move down to verse 26. Same chapter, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Teach you all things. What, all, what things? And bring to your remembrance all that what? All that I have said to you. Who's, who's the I here? Jesus. Right? So he calls the Spirit the Spirit of truth, but the Spirit is not giving you truth in some vague sense. Like, hey, I'm a... By the way, the sky's blue. Did you know? Hey, the grass, that's not what the truth is. It's a specific truth. Specifically, the Holy Spirit is there, is accessible to bring to your mind the things that who has taught you? Jesus. Bringing to your mind the things Jesus has taught you. But not just that. Keep reading. Go now to verse 15. Uh, sorry, chapter 15. One chapter over, verse 26. Jesus again brings out the Holy Spirit. Verse 26 of chapter 15 in John. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. Do you see how Jesus is hammering this into his disciples? He's trying to make it clear. Like, look, when the Helper, when the Spirit comes, whom I'm going to send. The Spirit of truth who proceeds from my Father, he will bear witness about who? About who? About me, about Jesus. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So, Here's the thing. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Because he's accessible. He's always with us. Number two, he reminds us not just of what Jesus taught us. He doesn't just witness to that. But more importantly, he reveals who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit comes by your side and helps you manifest to the world and witness to the world who God really is. Breaking down all these lies about who God is and isn't, helping people realize, wow, God is... God loves me. God came and died on the cross for me. God wants what's best for me. That's what the Holy Spirit comes to reveal. Reveal who God is in, in his truth over and against the lies that the devil has planted in the minds of so many people. And so in John, go ahead one more chapter. John 16, verses 13 through 15. Here Jesus is kind of summarizing everything he, he said. John chapter 16, verse thir starting at verse 13. When the spirit of what? Of truth, right? He calls it the spirit of truth because the spirit brings, again, not just truth in a general sense, but the truth that people are yearning for, the truth that people need. He will guide you into all the truth. For he will not, now notice this, he will not speak on what? On his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify who? Me. Who's me? Jesus. He will glorify Jesus, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Okay, let's unpack that. The Holy Spirit, in other words, Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit doesn't have his own ag agenda. The Holy Spirit isn't just operating independently as a rogue agent. The Holy Spirit is taking what is whose? What belongs to Jesus and bringing who actually, that which belongs to Jesus, actually belongs to who else? The Father, right? Jesus says, all that, is, all that the Father has is now mine, and what is mine, now the Spirit takes that. So, a little side note here. We as Adventists, I believe, have had, at least in my experience, we've had an arm's length relationship to the Holy Spirit. And here's partially why we spoke about this in, in Sabbath school. How many of you has had someone come up to you and say, hey, the Spirit told me, blah, 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 blah. I've had it happen. My, my wife has had it happen. Maybe it's, maybe you're like, I'm the person this happened to, right? 
it, but it happens, right? And, how, and we hear stories of also, not just that, but we hear stories of people who go and do things that seem kind of out there because the quote-unquote Holy Spirit told them to. Or we hear stories of people who go and have these weird ex- physical, mental experiences where like, oh, I felt the Spirit come upon me. And then my body was just, it, it just collapsed and I felt peace and joy and happiness all at once. You know, you, have, you, you hear about these experiences. Or you hear about the Holy Spirit falling upon a place and all of a sudden miracles start to happen and people get healed. So we think, I'm not here to tell you that all of that is illegitimate. There's probably some legitimacy to some of that. But what happens is oftentimes we hear people claim that the Holy Spirit was moving and then we see fruits that don't correspond to what we have in the Word. And so what happens, we're like, I don't want to fall into that trap. And so we put distance between ourselves and the workings of the Holy Spirit because we don't want to be led down the path of apostasy, of of false signs and wonders, of being deceived, rightly so. Right? We don't want to fall into some misunderstanding of what the Spirit is supposed to do. But here's what happens. And listen very carefully. Because we don't want to, in, in trying to avoid false workings of a false spirit, we become content with lacking the true spirit. Let me say that one more time. Because we are concerned with being led astray by a false spirit, we become content with lacking the true spirit. And so we say, okay, well, we don't want to deal with anything that has to do with the Holy Spirit. But then we forget that Jesus still promised us, no, but the Holy Spirit is going to come. And he is going to help you. And he's supposed to do certain things for you. And you need him if you're going to witness and get the right job done. So then the question is not, well, I need, I have to avoid the, the not question. The, the job is not to avoid the Holy Spirit. It's to discern the Holy Spirit. And so again, we're not supposed to put distance between ourselves and the Spirit. We're supposed to discern the Holy Spirit. What do I mean? Let me give you a simple principle to help you and I not live in fear of, a, of some weird thing that does weird stuff to church people, but a, dis, a, a principle to help you actually embrace God's true Spirit. Go back to the verse I, I just read. Verse 13 of chapter 16 in John. It's actually in there. Jesus says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Notice this, for he will not speak on what? His own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And and in fact, he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify who? Jesus. For he will take what is mine, what what belongs to Jesus, and declare it to you. Here's, friends, here's the principle. Jesus is telling you that the Holy Spirit isn't operating on his own accord. The Holy Spirit comes to reveal to you and bring to your mind and lead you in a path that is in conformity to the path Jesus has set out already in the Gospels. Let me say it again. The Holy Spirit comes not to lead you into some strange new thing, but to only further move you forward in the path that Jesus has set out in his word. And Jesus says, all that I have that belongs to the Father. So in other words, The Holy Spirit is meant to guide you and lead you and bring you into a greater understanding and depth of what Jesus and God has revealed in the Old and the New Testament. In other words, you want to know if the the Holy Spirit that you feel is interacting with you is true? Ask yourself, is this leading me to come more into conformity with what I already know? Or is it leading me somewhere else where, where the fruits don't match this? And we can answer that. Right? We, we can say, does this line up with what I know? And if it does, hey, walk in that direction. But if it doesn't, well, don't be afraid and say, well, I'm not going to trust any Holy Spirit. I'm just going to be... Just say, well, that's not the right Spirit. Because again, the Spirit is only going to lead you, not on His own path, but with what Jesus has already taught you. Right? So again, the Spirit, this is how you not put distance between you and the Spirit, but how you discern the Spirit Ask yourself, does this line up with what Jesus has revealed to me in his word? And if it does, walk in that way. And so here's what I want to do now. I'm actually going to help us all out today. We're going to figure out what does the moving and the working and the leading of the Spirit actually look like in the Bible? Because we think, well, okay, listen to the Holy Spirit. And we're like, well, what does it look like? Well, the Bible actually gives us clues. Not just clues, it, it shows us. So let's see if this thing works. Okay, so the question is, what does a spirit-filled life look like? Because we're, ta- 
I'm telling you here that we need to take the priority, which is the Holy Spirit, and, and embrace that. Okay, well, well what, what, am I, what, what am I expecting, right? What is that going to look like once I actually embrace that reality in my life? If Jesus says that he sent it, well, I want to, re- I want to receive, but I need to know what I'm headed for. Well, here we go. We're going to go through the book of Acts. We're going to look, what does a spiritual life look like in the book of Acts? So we have here Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 and verse 41. I want you guys, as we read these verses, look for what the Spirit does and what happens when, when the Spirit comes, okay? So it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all what? Together in what? In, in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing what? Wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Can you imagine? You're there all together and all of a sudden a piece of fire shows up on top of your head. This happened. This is not just a funny story that we tell because this is reality. But, and just a note, notice it says they were all what? In, in one place together. I don't think the Bible mentions that just as an aside, like, oh, they just happened to all be hanging out. They were all together in one place. In other words, what were they doing up there? Praying. Praying for one goal, united, together. In other words, the Spirit comes and moves with power when God's people decide to look past all the differences and say, look, we need the Holy Spirit. That's what we all need, regardless of where we are in our walk with God. And they decide to get together and they pray as one, in one accord, for the same goal. That's when, when the Spirit comes. So the Spirit comes, well, it says there, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in what? In other, ooh, there, there's that word, speaking in tongues, right? And this is, I think, where many Adventists get nervous. Like, oh, we hear stories of people speaking in tongues. What does that, that mean? Well, let's look here. Began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And what I didn't put there for the sake of space. Sorry, there it is. I have it. My bad. What I didn't stick in there is that the tongues they were speaking were what? Were languages of other Jews who came to visit Jerusalem. And people say in the text, if you read it in Acts 2, they say, why do I hear the gospel being preached in my language? So the Spirit isn't giving you tongues that are just this random language that no one understands. It's for a purpose of communicating what? The the gospel, right? So people hear the gospel because the, the Holy Spirit came and filled everyone. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about what? 3,000 people accepted the gospel because God's people were willing to be filled with the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit do for them what he wanted to do. Let them speak in real tongues so that the gospel can be preached. So do we want to see our church grow by 3,000? be amazing. Now, I'm not preaching this sermon because I want a fixed number to show up in our church. That's not the, the point. It's, hey, if we want to do our mission, well, let's pay attention to what the book says, right? Next one. Acts uh, 4, verse 8. Then Peter filled with, with, with what? The Holy Spirit said to them, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, by which we must be what? Saved. So in other words, here's what happens here. The Holy Spirit comes and gives you the message. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you know just what to say to help people come to know the truth, right? The Holy Spirit comes on Peter, and he begins to preach the gospel. Acts 4, 31. And when they had, what's the word there? prayed. The place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with what? Holy Spirit. And continue to speak the word of God with what? Boldness. So this is a cool story because right before this text, John and Peter are in the temple and they were preaching the gospel and the Jewish leaders come and say, hey, don't you dare ever speak about this Jesus again. You stop that. You're causing trouble. And John and Peter give this amazing response. They say, look, we can't help but be witnesses about what we have what? But what we've seen. And so it says that they threatened them again. So look, just stop talking. They leave. They go to all the disciples. And they say, hey guys, look, we just got told that we can't speak about God anymore. And so what do they do? They pray again. They're filled with the Holy Spirit again. And they continue to speak with boldness. In other words, the Holy Spirit gives you the ability and the courage to be a Christian when pressures from the world tell you to do otherwise. 
when the world puts pressure on you to not be who God called you to be, it's the spirit that comes in you and says, no, be bold and allow yourself to preach the gospel, not just in your words, but in your actions, in your life. The spirit gives you boldness. Next one. Acts 6, this is 5, 8 through, through 10. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and what? Full of the Holy Spirit. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great. What's the word there? What was he doing? Wonders in? He was doing miracles. The Holy Spirit doesn't just give you boldness to speak, doesn't just help you know what, what, what to say, doesn't just help you preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit we have to accept this because it's in the word. The Holy Spirit fills you and you are, God gives you the ability to, on his behalf, carry out miracles, wonders, and signs. So while we acknowledge rightly that there are some signs and wonders that are false and that come from the evil one, we do God a disservice when we say that the Holy Spirit can't do signs and wonders among us. Friends, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were doing signs and wonders. Stephen was reading on. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with who? Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the what? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you, again, the ability to not be pushed back when the enemy tries to silence you, tries to overcome you. The devil can't withstand you when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Reading on. Acts 7, verse 55. But he, full of the what? Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This is Stephen, right as he's dying. Holy Spirit comes and gives him a vision of heavenly things. Right? Many of us here in the Adventist church, we know of the ministry of this woman called Ellen White, and we, many of us believe that she had visions. Friends, what if I told you today that that wasn't just her privilege? What if I told you that you could be filled with the Spirit? And if God wanted to reveal things to you, he could because it happens. That God might also reveal, give you the privilege to see things that many of us don't. Moving on, Acts 8, verse 29. And this, who said to Philip? The Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him, him being, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, someone coming on his way from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia. Theopia, not really, not a Jew, but someone who was studying about it. And I don't know how the Spirit spoke to Philip. I don't know if it was a thought that he had, if it was a voice that he heard, if he just had this vision or whatever. But what we know is that the Bible first that the Spirit says things. And specifically, the Spirit communicates to us. And it tells Philip, hey, go over and join the, this, this uh, chariot here. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless what someone guides me? And he, he, the Ethiopian eunuch, invited Philip to come up and sit with them. Friends, the Holy Spirit helps you know when you ought to speak up and reach out to someone who's yearning for the gospel. The Holy Spirit's there says, hey, hey, this is your chance. Offer to pray. Offer to mention about what God has done for you. Ask him if he has any questions. It's the Spirit. And I don't know what that looks like, but He does it. That, that's the thing. I don't know what the Spirit's communication in your life looks like, but we're here to affirm that He does communicate and wants to communicate with you. It's your privilege to be led by the Spirit. Reading on Acts 9, 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the what? Of the Holy Spirit. It, it what? It multiplied, right? Reading on Acts 13, verse 2. Through four, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the what? Holy Spirit said, set apart from Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by who? Not by men. By the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. The Holy Spirit also shows us who needs to do certain tasks. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts and says, hey, I'm raising you to be a leader of a ministry of a job, of a certain task. I want you to go and do this certain thing for me. Imagine, imagine if we as a church elected leaders, not by what we saw, but by the leading of the Spirit. The Spirit said, hey, you know what? Don't look at the outward appearance. Pick that guy for the job. He's the guy I'm setting apart. It happens. How they were in tune? Well, they were. How they heard, we don't know, but it happens. Acts 16, verses 6 through Seven. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by who? 
for the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of who? Jesus did not allow them. Uh, did not allow them. So the Holy Spirit do doesn't just lead you in the right way. The Holy Spirit also cuts you off and says, hey, son, daughter, this isn't where you need to go. It corrects you. It offers you the right direction. As one of the youth said, it's the therapist in your head, right? I like that phrase. It's the one guiding you. And last one here, Acts 20, 22 to 23. And now behold, this is Paul speaking. I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by who? By the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me, there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction await me. Imagine that the Holy Spirit is not only leading you, but then saying, hey, by the way, where I'm leading you, it's going to be rough times, Paul. It's going to be rough times, Brandon. It's going to be rough times. But you know what? It doesn't matter because the Holy Spirit is leading me. And what we've been seeing is that the Holy Spirit tells me what I need to say. The Holy Spirit gives me boldness to say it. The Holy Spirit helps me know when to say it. The Holy Spirit helps me know where to go, where not to go, what to do. The Holy Spirit guides his people. And this is a biblical reality. And the question for us is how we've been missing out on this. Have we been missing out on receiving the guidance and the leading of the moving of the Holy Spirit? So then, I don't know about you, but I want this in my life. It, it, it might be a little scary because, again, we were talking with the youth. When the Spirit comes and guides you, you have to be open not just to the good news it brings, but to the correction he brings. But I want God... I want this relationship with God where not just me, but we as a church can say, hey, the Holy Spirit told us to do this. And again, not in some mystical, weird, new age way. The Holy Spirit might lead through a person. It might lead through a, through a verse that he brings to mind. But I want us as a church, myself first, to have the guiding and the leading and the empowering and the equipping of the Holy Spirit. I want to be part of what that church was doing. And so then... If that's your desire, then the next question is this. Well, how do we get filled with the Holy Spirit then? And actually, it's quite beautifully, quite beautifully simple. Go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 11. I'm so glad that God made this as simple as he did. Luke, chapter 11, as we get ready to, um, as we're winding down here. Luke 11, verse 9. Luke chapter 11, verse 9. I want you guys to see this for yourselves. So Jesus here is telling a parable, right? He's teaching. He says in verse 9 of chapter 11 of Luke, And I tell you, ask, and it will be what? Given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For how many? Everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now, he gives an illustration. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? In other words, he says, look, you parents, in fact, your kids don't even need to ask you for food. Most kids who grow up in a decent home, it's a given that when they go home, there's what? There's food, there's a clean bed, there's clean clothes. They have what they need. Children live, for the most part, with the confident expectation that what they need to do their kid thing is going to be provided by their parents. How much more when they ask, hey, mom, I'm hungry. What mom is it going to go out of her way to feed her kids? What dad is it going to go out of his way to help his child feel comforted when they're hurting? So look at what God says. Verse 13, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask him. To those who what? Ask him. So how do you get the Holy Spirit? You ask. You get the Holy Spirit by asking. Okay. Okay, Pastor Jaime, I ask. Now what? Go with me to the book of First John. Say, okay, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Now what? First John. Go with me to First John chapter 5. First John is towards the end of the Bible, right before uh, the book of Revelation. 1 John chapter 5, a small book. 1 John 5, verse 14. I love this verse. This is such a beautiful promise. 1 John chapter 5, 
verse 14. It says, and this is the, what's the word there? The confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he what? He hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we what? Have. Have the request that we have asked for. Not we will have or we hope to have or we will have in a week or a month. No. When you ask according to God's will, he hears you. And because he hears you, you can be confident in that moment that you have the thing that you've asked God. So when you ask the Holy Spirit, what do you do? What? You believe. With confident expectation, the way a little child asks his mom and dad for food, and mom's like, yeah, I got you. I'm going to feed you. We ask, and then we believe. And so then here's the next thing. Some of you might be like, okay, I ask for the Holy Spirit. I believe, and then what? Do the skies open up, and you know, like the, you know, the hallelujah chorus starts, and I, and I feel this light? What happens next? What does that look like? You just live your life. Like, huh? What do you mean? Let me tell you something, friends. I don't think that the disciples in early church times, I don't think they sat around all day just saying, all right, guys, we're going to sit today and we're going to wait till God tells us what we need to do. And don't you dare move until he says something. Did the disciples already know what their mission was? They did. Did God tell them specifically what to do? Go and what? Make disciples, baptize in how many nations? All nations. So here's what happens. They knew what they had to do. They went and lived their lives knowing they were filled with the Holy Spirit, always open to, hey, if I'm about to do something wrong, Holy Spirit's going to let me know, right? The Spirit stopped Paul, right, from going into a certain place. He wasn't worried saying, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? He said, God, I know what your will is in the broad sense. I'm going to live my life to the best of my ability doing it. And when the right time comes and when I need the things that I need, I trust that because your spirit dwells with me and in me, as Jesus said, he's going to come through for me at the right time. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to ask for the spirit, believe that he's with me, and live my life. And God's spirit, friends, will work wonders in your life. And as we end here, I want to just say this. The temptation might come in your mind after this message to think, well, if the Spirit is the priority I need for witnessing, well, if I'm not doing much witnessing, then I don't need to be concerned about having the Spirit. Be careful. Here's why. The Spirit isn't just essential for your life for witnessing. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and friends. Holy Spirit isn't just a benefit to you when you're out witnessing or when you're being a loving person. Does your marriage need help? Do you want to be a parent that's more patient with your kids? Do you have a lack of love for those around you? Do you suffer from not having as much joy in your life? Do you wish you had more self-control? Ask to be filled with the Spirit, and the fruits of the Spirit will come in your life. So the Spirit is not just something that we need when we're here at church doing churchy things. The Spirit is the thing you need to live your best life all the time. And praise the Lord that God made it so simple for you. He says, ask, believe, and live your life, and the fruits of the Spirit will show up. God will lead you into opportunities to practice them. And not just leave you there, but then He empowers you to choose to be patient, to choose to be loving, to choose to have joy. So friends, here's my appeal to you. We have... About seven, eight days in January left. I want to challenge you. Would you join me in praying for the Holy Spirit in our lives, in the lives of our families, in the lives of our kids? By the way, think of how powerful this is. In the morning when you wake up, you say, Father, fill my son, my daughter with your Holy Spirit today. Think of how powerful it is for you as a parent to pray that blessing over your son and your daughter. Join me for the next seven to eight days until the end of this month. Pray every day for the Holy Spirit. You think, oh, I have to do something. It's not a half-hour thing. This is simple. When you wake up in the morning, here's, what, here's what, what I'm challenging you to pray and what I'm going to challenge myself to pray with too. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me see how your Spirit is moving in my life and, in, and around me. Let me make it more simple than that. Father, fill me with your, your Spirit and help me see your Spirit at work. That's the prayer. I want to challenge you. 
Join me in praying that prayer between now and the end of the month. Here's why. Because before we as a church make plans to go and witness and go be God's light and go be the salt of the earth, Jesus told us, you need to be filled with power from on high with the promise of the Father. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit if we're going to do this job right. So my encouragement to you, friends, is this. Pray to be filled with the Spirit. Pray for yourself. Pray for your kids. Pray for your marriages, for your homes. Pray for our church to be filled with the Spirit. And as we do that, we're going to be doing the kind of things that this church in Acts was doing. Maybe not doing all the miracles we think God should do or we want Him to do, but we're going to be moving forward with power and the gospel is going to go out and the church is going to multiply. Because this, where the Spirit goes, there is power. And when God gives us His power, He gives us His power to be His witnesses. So friends, join me in praying for the Holy Spirit between now and the end of the month. And my encouragement is don't just stop then. But keep praying for the Spirit until the day Jesus comes. Let's be a church and a people that are filled with God's Holy Spirit. Let's get that priority settled in our hearts this morning. So let's start now. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for leaving us not alone, but giving us a helper. Jesus, we thank you because you're in heaven interceding for us. But Father, you've not left us alone. We have the Holy Spirit with us, our friend, our comforter, our helper. Not just that, Father, but you promised to fill us with him when we ask. So Father, right now, I want to ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill this church, fill everyone in this room with your Holy Spirit. Father, we believe that you have done it, not because we feel different, not because we feel warm and fuzzy, but because you promised it. It's your will for us to be filled with the Spirit. So having believed that we are filled, help us to live our lives in tune to what you're doing around us. That when you, it comes time for your spirit to give us boldness, to prompt us, to talk to someone, to, to not go here, to do this, help us to listen. And Father, may we live each of our days asking, believing, and living in harmony with the spirit that we may be the kind of people that point you, point the world to you and reveal who you are being your faithful witnesses. We ask this in the beautiful and wonderful name of Jesus. And for his sake, we pray. Let everyone say, amen. Friends, in harmony with this promise of being filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to sing showers of blessings. So please stand with us as we sing this hymn and this promise and this plea for God to continue to fill us each and every day of our lives. Hymn number 195, showers of blessings. Showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshed.
Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Trish family.